give you salvation just to possess it. You and I are to become the Christians God saved us to become. Chapel in uh, Birmingham, where our folks are striving to do the Lord's work. And we had taken our choir there from the college, and the people sat and watched and listened to that choir, and, uh, and some sort of, I guess, vernacular that you would use today, they were sort of blown away by it all. They did a great job. I was to speak after that. Now this is a, a building that had been empty. They hadn't heard the sound of children's voices in years in that place. And the, the building area, the area where the chapel's located, is surrounded with children. It was surrounded with children. And I said to them, I'm going to try to speak. But what we're trying to say here is that we want to provide the opportunity for boys and girls and young people all around here that these young people who've been singing have been provided because the same kind of people are out here who can be reached and trained for the Lord and for His glory if someone will just put their heart in it. I remember saying that distinctly in that place and I meant it I meant it. And I say, when I'm sitting here thinking, Elizabeth plays beautifully at the piano a moment ago, I'd like to say to all these young people and children, this is available to you. We want to teach you. We've established a school where you can come. You say, I don't have the money. You don't need the money. You just need the heart to do it and the access to get there. And so... These men singing, we want you, not only to do these things, all of you, but to enjoy it, to enjoy doing what you do for the Lord. And you see, we, we've lost touch sometimes with the fact that so few people have ever had the opportunities we've had. So few people have ever heard what we've heard. And so few people are going to be as accountable to God as we are accountable to God. And so may God help us, may God help us in a big way, may God help us. I'd like you to take the word of God, please, and turn with me in the New Testament to the book of Hebrews, chapter 9. And by the way, as a teenager, I couldn't have found the book of Hebrews. Someone would have had to find it for me. And I'm glad someone did. Hebrews chapter 9, we're going to begin in Hebrews chapter 9 with verse 27. I'm speaking on 10 things you need to do before you die. 10 things you need to do before you die. I'd like you to make note of those things. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27, and as is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. It's appointed to die. We all have an appointed time to die, and after this the judgment. Now I'd like you to turn with me, please, to the gospel according to John, if you would. In the gospel record of John chapter 5, in John chapter 5, the Lord Jesus is being accused of making himself equal with God. And he answers his ac accusations and his accusers. And one of the things he answers with in John chapter 5 and verse 21, As the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. And in verse 22 of John 5, the Lord Jesus says, For the Father judgeth no man, but at the committed all judgment unto the Son. Now the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27, 
and as is appointed to men once to die, but after this the judgment. It says also in John chapter 5 and verse 22 that all judgment has been committed to Jesus Christ. So what that simply means is that every one of us and every human being that's ever lived on this earth will have an inevitable meeting with Jesus Christ. The Word of God says, death, then after death, the judgment. I hope you don't think this has anything to do with my preaching, but while we're in this meeting all around this world, more than 8,000 people will die. While we're gathered here in this meeting, more than 8,000 people will die. The Bible says appointed a man wants to die. Statistically, that means nothing to us because we're not personally involved. We trust in the deaths of any of those 8,000 plus people. It's only a statistic. But there are real people all over this globe who will take their last breath and meet God while we're gathered here. More than 8,000 of them statistically. Now someday, you and I will be a part of that statistic. There's no question about it. Uh, David said in one of his psalms, once I was young and now I am old. He went on to say he hadn't seen the righteous forsaken or their seed begging bread, but the point is, he says, there was a time I was a young person and now I am an old person. He meant by that, we think, past 60. Young, old. We travel through. It happens. And what I want to give you as God allows me to speak is 10 things. I want to talk about 10 things that we all must do before we die. I say we must do if we're going to please God. These are things we must do. I've decided to give 10 separate messages on those 10 things, and for that you can be very happy that we're not trying to crowd all this in into one message. And so where will we begin? I have a list I'm going to read the list. If you'd like to write it down, fine, but it'll be recorded and it'll also be given to you if I live and the Lord doesn't come. Ten things we must do before we die. Number one, we must love the Lord our God with all our heart. Number two, love our neighbor as ourself. Number three, add to our faith. Number four, have a thoroughly Christian home. Number five, develop the gift of God that is in us. Number six, become a spiritual person. Number seven, gain perspective. Number eight, Become witnesses of God's grace. Number nine, enjoy our lives. And number ten, make a difference in the life of someone else. I believe I've written more than 80 different things down trying to come to some conclusions. Thinking, praying, studying, and I believe if I had to give a list of 10 things you and I must do before we die, I've given you that list. Let's begin with number one in this particular message. If you'll turn with me, please, in your Bibles, in the New Testament to the Gospel according to Matthew. In the 22nd chapter of Matthew, our Lord is getting it, as we might say, from the Herodians and from the Sadducees and from the Pharisees. Our Lord warned us about the leaven of the Herodians and the leaven of the Sadducees and the leaven of the Pharisees. The Herodians were 
people who represented worldliness. They were identified with the Herodian family. That Herodian dynasty lasted for a little more than a century. Years ago, I spoke to you and taught on the Herodian family. And then the religious group of the Sadducees, the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection of the dead as it's taught in God's Word. And then the Pharisees, if the Sadducees were the religious liberals, the Pharisees were the religious hypocrites. Jesus warned of the leaven of the Herodians' worldliness and he warned of the Sadducees and their denial of truth and he warned of the Pharisees and their hypocrisy. Now they're coming after the Lord. At your leisure, I'd like for you to read what, what they said and how he responded to them. Because finally, the Bible says in verse 46, and no man was able to answer him a word, neither does any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. And so when he was finished with them, the Bible says in verse 46 of Matthew 22, they decided they wouldn't ask him any more questions. But in the midst of that conversation, verse 34 in Matthew chapter 22, the Bible says, but when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together, then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So I want you to mark well, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. So as we begin this series of 10 messages on 10 things we must do before we, we die, First, we must learn to love our God. We must learn to love our God. How do we learn to love our God? When we learn to love our God and be true followers of our God because of our love for Him, everything else in life will find its rightful place. This is the heart of the Christian faith. It's the very thing that God Himself placed at the top. If you and I had the privilege to ask the Lord, Lord, tell me in my journey, no matter how many days I live, I'm to number my days and apply my heart in a certain way, and I may live three score and ten, or if by opportunity, four score years, yet there's going to be strength, labor, and sorrow, as you say in the 90th Psalm. Tell me, tell me the most important thing I can do in my life before I die. There's no question in my mind that he would say, learn to love thy God. Learn to love thy God. Now I have young preachers come to me and say, I want you to give me the greatest lesson you give me on being a preacher. And I say to them, get out of bed. And they wait for something else. I don't say anything else. Live a disciplined life. Get out of bed. Just get out of bed and get going. And God will lead you. You see, I've given up playing God with people. I, I do give instruction and I teach people and I've enjoyed that for many, many years. But I believe that God will speak to us. You know why I believe God will speak to us? Because the Lord is that interested in our lives. And He's that interested in the lives of people you know, some of whom you do not love. But he, he is that interested in their lives. That verse we began with in John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's what God says. And everything else 
is a response to that. Everything. It's all a response to that. I want you to look with me, please, in the gospel record according to John. Would you please? And let's, let's, let's work on this just for a moment uh, and work on it with all of our heart. In John chapter 14 and verse 1, remember the Lord Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me and my Father's house and many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. And whether I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we know not whether thou goest. How can we know the way? And the Lord Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now, this is what he said. He said, we live in a world with many religions. Yes, I agree. We live in a world with many different thoughts about God. Yes, I agree with you. But the Lord Jesus Christ, whom I believe to be God, co-equal, co-existent, eternally existent with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, God who cannot lie, God who became a man without ceasing to be God, said there is no way you could even know God unless you come by me to know him. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's what Jesus Christ said. Now we're talking about learning to love God. Learning to love the Lord Jesus. And to do what we do, respond as we respond, because we love the Lord Jesus. Notice the immediate response. He says, if you had known me, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth, you know him and have seen him. And Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? Think of that. He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Now, you want to know God? You can't love him if you don't know him. I can't love him if I don't know him. We know him through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. When we come to know Christ as our Savior, when we ask God to forgive our sin and by faith, trust him as a Savior, when we repent of our sin and come to know Christ as Savior, we come to God. There is no other way. Jesus said this. And if you believe anything else, you're doubting the honesty and the integrity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ, who is God, who cannot lie, declared himself, I am the way. No man cometh in the Father but by me. Now think of this. Now, the Word of God also says, if you'll continue with me in this, in this chapter, he says in verse 27 of this same chapter, Peace I have, I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth give unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Now notice there are things that God can give us that the world cannot give us. Let me repeat that. There are things that God can give us that the world cannot give us. And as human beings, we look for things that we honestly desire and need, but we cannot find them in this world. It is impossible for anyone or anything in this world apart from God to give us these things that only God can give us. He happens to mention peace here. Peace. We can have peace with God. We can eventually have the peace of God. You think about that. When you and I talk about everything that's wrong in the world and the disruptions everywhere and we watch the news and we see people just doing every violent thing imaginable, uh, disrupting entire societies, destroying cities, 
and uh, rebelling against all authority, this anarchist spirit that seems to be pervading throughout all the world. And we think of God. Do you think God is on the throne of this universe, wringing his hands and thinking, what am I going to do? Absolutely not. All is well in the heart of God. And God says this peace with him can bring us to the place where we have his peace. I, I talk to people who are going through some of the most severe tests and to my amazement, they're at peace. As I said just a, a while back, I was praying with a lady who had, had to face one of the most serious surgeries a woman could imagine facing. I went early to the hospital to see her, to pray with her, to try to encourage her and her family. And I, I was encouraged myself to see the peace of God that she had. I stood just days ago beside the bed of one of our dying saints. They called and said, Mrs. Phillips doesn't have much longer in this world. And I rushed over to the hospital and came into the room and, and greeted the family and then moved to the side of her bed. Stella Phillips has, has been a dear friend, a faithful co-laborer, a wonderful Christian, a faithful wife. And I got very near her, called her name, and she, she opened her eyes and she looked at me and she spoke. She spoke. I bent over to kiss her on her forehead and place my hand on her cheek to rub her cheek, very close to her face. I talked to her. I said, now, you're going very soon to be with Jesus. And you're going very soon to be with Dan. You're going to see them in just a little bit. She smiled. We prayed together. I thought, I thank God to be a pastor. Because as a pastor, I'm watching God at work in the life of one of his children. No fear. No hesitation. No concern about dying. She learned to love the Lord, her God, with all her heart. And she was thrilled to think about, I'm going to meet him. I'm going to see him. And in less than an hour of my being in that room, she was in heaven. That's peace. The Lord gives it. What greater thing could I tell you when God himself has said this is the greatest thing to learn to love the Lord our God. I want you to turn with me to John chapter 17, would you please? In John chapter 17, our Lord is praying this high priestly prayer and in verse 3 he says, This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. If anybody ever asks you, what is eternal life? Don't try to explain it to them. Just take them to this Bible verse. Let God speak for himself. When we read the word of God, God is speaking for himself. If you said to me, what do you think about your wife or you think about your ministry? I would speak to you. When I speak, I'm speaking for myself. Someone might say, did, did the pastor say that to you? And if you heard my word, you say, yes, he spoke this himself. Well, I want you to know, we're talking about eternal life and knowing God. Let God speak for himself. And let's read it again. As he speaks for himself, he says, this is life eternal. That they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. They said, what's the greatest commandment? He said, to love the Lord with all your heart. If that's the greatest commandment, then the greatest sin we commit as believers is our failure to love him and to do what he says. This is why we obey him. I want you to turn again with me, would you please, to the, gospel, to the first book of John, 1 John chapter 4. In 1 John chapter 4, there's a great deal said here about loving one another. 
And in chapter 4, verse 10, the human penman, the apostle John writes, Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sin. He, he sent his son to satisfy the righteous demand God himself made that sin be punished. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And so, not that we loved him, but that he loved us. I want you to try to remember that. And now I want you to turn with me again to what the Apostle Paul has written concerning the love of Christ in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Our response to God, our love to God, is a response of his love to us. And so let's logically think about this just a minute. If the thing on the top of our list happens to be the same thing on the top of God's list, I think we've got our list right. Would you agree? And sometimes we get awfully fussy, if you might allow the word to be a part of this uh, thought. We get awfully fussy about all the things we're to do. But the truth is, if we'd back up and love God like we ought to love God, we wouldn't be fussing so much about all these things we fail to do. You say, well, I have a real problem. No, 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 no. You and I don't have a real problem with anybody. The real problem we have is with God. Not loving Him like we ought to love Him. I mean, I have people, I, I'm, I'm making a confession here. I have people that I have a difficult time with. And the only way in the world I can solve that difficulty is to love God like I ought to love God. And God will enable me to deal lovingly with those people. Now notice what Paul writes here under the inspiration of the Spirit of God in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 14, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him who died for them and rose again. Is it possible that we've forgotten that Jesus died for us? That we needed a Savior? When we point an accusing finger at everyone else and we talk about what's wrong with them, is it possible we forgot what was wrong with us? The stain of sin and that Christ died for us. May God help us. He says, therefore, in verse 17, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. It all begins with God. This entire life should be beginning with learning to love the Lord. I want you to watch closely. When, when newborns come into a home and we say the parents are Christians, the parents should demonstrate first and foremost to that child their love, not for the child but their love for God. The greatest gift we give our children is not our love, it's our love for God. And the way we talk about the things of God, the way we talk about the Bible, every Christian should read the Bible, study the Bible. Matter of fact, all of us should determine we're going to read the Bible through and study the Bible through. Every Christian should pray and prayer should be our, our Christian life, we pray about all things. People should hear us say, let's pray about it. They should know we pray about things. All of that should grow out of our love for God. No doubt about it. We should be right toward our family, toward our children, toward other people. But if when we love God like we ought to love God, 
We're going to be able to be right toward them. And we're going to be able to be instructors to our children that we love God because the greatest thing our children need is they need to learn to love God. When they love, love God and adore the Lord and worship the Lord, they're not going to get into some of the things the world's going to tempt them with. When they truly love Jesus and want to please Jesus, when the temptations come, and they will come, He and He alone is able to help them resist the temptation. When sinners, when sinners are tempting them and enticing them, they do not consent, not because the sin is not attractive, it's because their love and loyalty belongs to Jesus. I'm going to tell you, beloved, we've missed a whole lot in this Christian life by running out there and dealing with peripheral things when we should have been dealing with the thing that God put at the top of the list. To love the Lord thy God. To love Him. Do you love Him? Well, you say, well, I stay mad at everybody, but I love God. No, you can't love God and stay mad at everybody. You say, well, every once in a while I have to I have to cheat a little on a deal, but I truly do love the Lord. No, you do not love the Lord. You do not. You're lying to yourself. You're living in self-deception. You just talk about everybody. We talk about people like we shouldn't talk. Why? Because we don't love God like we all love God. If we loved God, we'd have His peace. And if we loved God... We'd be praying to God for those people instead of talking so much about them to other people. I know ministers who don't love God. I know Sunday school teachers who don't love God. I know children's workers who don't love God. They've enlisted in Christian work without Christ being the reason. And by the way, how do I know that? How do I recognize it? Because I've seen it far too often in my own life in my own life. Oh, God help us. We get saturated with His love for us and we respond to His love by loving Him. That's what the Bible says. Christ and Christ alone is to become our life. Paul said, me to live is Christ, to die is gain. In the book of Colossians, would you turn there please? In the book of Colossians, this is what the Lord says. In Colossians chapter 2, speaking of Christ, in verse 3, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In Jesus, everything is in Jesus. When you get Jesus, you get everything you need. When you love Jesus... Like we ought to love Jesus. He helps us with everything else. All the treasures are in Him. All. All of it's in Him. So on our journey of ten things we must do before we die, our Lord doesn't leave us in doubt. At the top of the list, at the very top of the list, He says we start here. Loving our Lord, loving God, as we ought to love God. Let's bow in prayer, may we? I want you to sit quietly. I want to ask you to, to respond honestly. How many of us know Him? We've asked Him to forgive our sin, and by faith we've trusted Him as our Savior. We truly know Him. Would you lift your hand, hold it high? We know Him. You know Him. Please be an honest man or an honest woman. You know him. Thank you. How many of you know him, but in your heart, your heart is smitten by his spirit because you know you don't love him like you ought to love him. Your actions prove it. We ought to love the things he loves. He loved the church and gave himself for it. Oh, may God help us. We must be more specific. If you do not know the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior, let me tell you this. He not only deserves to be your Savior, 
He's the only one who can save you. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby you must be saved. Will you call on him and ask him to forgive your sin and be your savior? Would you right where you are ask God to forgive your sin and ask Jesus Christ to be your savior? He deserves it. He paid the sin debt for you and for me so that he could be our savior. He was buried and rose from the dead. He is alive evermore. He has the power to be our savior. May God help you right now where you're sitting to pray this prayer to him. Dear Lord God, forgive my sin. I trust Jesus Christ and Christ alone for my soul's salvation. Help me live for you from this day forward. In Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer from your heart, would you say, yes, I have. Would you slip up your hand? I'm not going to embarrass you. I prayed that prayer. God bless you. I mean, right here today, you prayed and asked God to forgive your sin and save you. Now, let me ask you. you right here today, ask God to forgive your sin and be your Savior. Would you lift your hand? He's a wonderful Savior. I want you to let someone take the Bible and tell you how God wants to help you to grow and to follow Him. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have allured my sight. I'm not only going to come to Him, I'm not only going to come to Him, I'm going to hasten and come to Him. How many of us as believers, as believers, how many of us as believers have have spent so much of life and time fussing about everything imaginable while neglecting to love the Lord our God as we ought to love Him. Cultivating that love through His Word, through prayer, through worship. You say, I'm a guilty man, I'm a guilty woman. God has spoken to my heart today. Would you lift your hand hold it high? You ought to leave your place and come and pray and say, Jesus, help me get this in line like it ought to be. Father, may thy will be done. In the name of Christ, we pray. Very quietly, would you stand, please, with heads bowed and eyes closed. Some of you have been saved but never identified with the Lord in believer's baptism. Some of you are visiting here and you think, why am I here? God wants your attention. You come. Let us talk with you, pray with you, help you. Even while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, you leave your place and come. Some of you want to put your life and influence in this church as a member. You come, would you? Leave your place and come. Let us pray with you, talk with you, and encourage you. All around, the Holy Spirit is pleading, working, talking. Just simply ask, why are you here? God is dealing, you come. We can get a long way off track when we've neglected this part of our lives. So long a way off track. May the Lord help us. Father, may thy will be done in Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hymn number 135. As we sing it, you leave your place and come now. 135. You come quickly. I am resolved.